I gave Kara a choice of two poems that I could do. One of them was a very short, simple one that I have performed several times before. And the other one is a very complex edit, epic that I think needs an explanation. And Kara picked the other. I'm just going to blame it all on me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a series of poems that I've been writing uh, since, I guess, the, the early 200s. How do you say that? The two aughts? Uh, the aught knots. That's one of my favorites. Um, they're called, it's, the series is called Disturbing Muses. And what I do in Disturbing Muses is I study a I study an artist, usually an early 20th century artist, because that's the period that obsesses me the most. And you get surrealism and cubism and Dadaism and all those things first starting. And uh, I take the details of the artist's biography and kind of combine them with the images in their paintings and create a sort of magical realist narrative uh, that you know imagines they actually encounter this, these things that they painted. And uh, one of my one of my biggest supporters in this series is a woman named Sonia Tate, friend of mine, a writer in Boston. When Leonora Carrington died. Uh, she asked me to write one of these disturbing music poems about her. And as she was the poetry editor of Strange Horizons, I got right on that. Um, and Leonora Carrington is a fascinating figure. She was a contemporary of Picasso, of Salvador Dali, of Tongi, of Juan Moreau, all those folks. But she was not celebrated in the same way that they were. And there's the basic reason is that she was a woman. Um, and her paintings, I encourage you to see them out, are, are really incredible. Uh, she had a, a pretty amazing life, too. I mean, she, she fled the aristocracy in Britain, uh, joined with these, uh, j joined with these uh, uh, fledgling master painters in Europe, had an affair with Max Ernst, uh, the great surrealist who was married at the time. Then she fled the Nazis, as they all had to, and uh, she uh, did not die young and tragic, another reason why she might not have been as well known going forward into the 20th century, but she certainly had plenty of opportunities to. She was trapped in a Spanish asylum for many years, getting shock treatment, and uh, she got out of that, escaped to Mexico, and then proceeded to paint happily for many, many decades, while basically ignored by the art establishment until the Times caught up with her and recognized her for the genius that she's been all along. And so I tried to encapsulate all of that in a poem. And here goes. Uh, one more thing. Ideally, a reading of this poem would have all the paintings that I used sort of arrayed behind me so that you could go, aha, aha, aha. But uh, you're just going to have to trust my impressions of the painting. I'm not saying you should. But you don't have a choice. <laughs> Carrington's Ferry. What threat could these scaly oarsmen ever pose? She dodged Miro's famished halo of animalcules, Picasso's rutting minotaur, Tongue's liquid probing pebbles, deflected Dali's softening emissions, sidestepped Duchamp's fractured descent. Her Cerberus grew far more heads than most. She kept the one whose kiss she chose to return and killed any others who rashly fought off sleep. Compared to them, this boat full of lizards, this hooded ferryman with forked tongue, had no hope in hell of harming her. She looks back at the red-gowned women, the graceful petals of their heads, Pale orchid blooms, nodding with the rhythm of the wind. Will they warn her if her next step goes awry? She first glimpsed them in the English gardens where she frolicked as a girl, but they never spoke, offered no chat, unlike the slow, thoughtful statues or the stained glass peacocks who would happily shriek her ears off. Don't let them send you away, they pleaded. Come back to us. Come back to us. 
how she tried, rebelled against her schoolmasters, whether at work or play, kept her attention focused in other space, the space she meant to see, how tight the sheets they wrapped her in to trap her, drag her silent from the hedgerow maze. No matter how shallow her footprints, the thunderous black beast sniffed out her path, the stone of her father's face crowning its shoulders, battlements shielding his ears, eyes empty as her hopes of escape. She would be a gift to the king, a dainty mosaic mortared in his courtyard, a bauble of fancied flesh. She attempted epic quests, all the time the tether thread coiled around her wrist, drawing her back to the drawing room, until the orchid maids nodded. The tunnel to their altar opened in his chest, this silver-haired, sly, smiling German, rimmed with light, shaded with night, the passage opening and opening into his body and beyond, her thread redirected inside, a guide to navigate a new labyrinth. She left a chortling hyena in her ballroom clothes and stole off to Paris, walked naked past the all-consuming artist's eyes, and told that dirty Spaniard Miro to fetch his own damn cigarettes. Her Max, already wed, but he could not and would not deny her. And the demons climbed from blood-soaked soil, too many to resist, and pried him away, laughing through dog fangs, kicking with jackboots, snarling with panther muzzles, armored with panzer hide. Running her down, she fled, carrying her into the Spanish asylum, where they pinned her down and racked her with bolts, poisoned her brain, ground against her bucking spirit, Quested to invade the maze, hunting for the gate she desperately held shut. Her father sent a rescuer by submarine, but as the taxi rushed the Lisbon streets, a voice heard from the wrong end of a trumpet whispered new instructions, and she demanded instead the embassy to Mexico. What chance Picasso's startled friend would greet her there? What chance in the distance past his shoulder? She'd see pale orchids nod their stately heads. The Nazis could not reach her anymore, nor the Nouveau Riche or the House of Lords. The hero twins called on her, the hunter and the jaguar, the grinning monkeys and the serpent who gifted her with feathers of every color, fierce freedom and her monster Diego. If she ever grew weary from their company, she could always steal into the hedgerows, her private garden were mannered harpies, poured tea, and priestesses bowed their horns. Attendants in crow masks bathed exquisite vultures, and butterfly-winged sphinxes guarded their eggs as tarot trumps walked arm in arm. Witchy trinities mixed spells in flower cups, and faces peered from canopies, playful ghosts snagged in the trees. Asked where she birthed the wonders, she snapped, you overthink. It's about seeing, about visions into other space. Both lands loved her in return. For decades she dreamed, long since freed of any limits. Stone, touched by her fingertips, took flight. In the maze, dark waters rise. The orchid maids watch, the ferryman wait. She snorts at them and turns the other way. She walks across the forest, looming into the sky. The wheat stalks of her hair channel the sun. She unfastens her robes, exposes hieroglyphs etched on her skin. Birds spill from beneath her breasts, shade the countryside with outstretched wings. <laughs>